Indicators are very important in the monitoring and evaluation process. In order to build them, we need data that can be collected from primary or secondary sources. The former is the data that we need to collect ourselves, while the latter represents the data that somebody else has already collected. There are pros and cons to both. Secondary data is more commonly used, as it typically requires much less resources, can be obtained virtually instantaneously and on a large scale. Think of downloading a large worldwide data set from the internet. However, while primary data acquisition can require more resources and time, it can in principle be of better quality, as the quality is under direct control and can be influenced, unlike the secondary data sources, and can be more easily adjusted to the specific needs in terms of the focus, like target group, content, like questions asked in the survey, and frequency, like specific time periods in which the data collection is repeated. We will list here a range of sophisticated techniques that are used to collect data from different channels. In principle, we divide them in two broad categories, quantitative and qualitative. On the one side, there are structured surveys created by asking people about their opinion or collecting facts about their activities and state of the reality. Then, official statistics published by the governmental agencies or other public bodies like OECD or World Bank then large and complex sets of data, like the data collection from social networks, then sensor data, like tracking traffic using satellite images, or even crowdsource data, like using mobile phone and GPS technologies to collect real-time traffic data. On the other side, there are qualitative techniques, like data collection from individuals or groups through a passive interaction and observation, like semi-structured interviews, data collection from active interaction and observation, like field work, and data collection from documents like white reports and scientific papers. All of the channels can be relevant, depending on the observed phenomenon and environmental conditions. While we have used in our examples indicators that were all quantitative in their nature, this is not the only type of indicators we can use. That is, we also distinguish quantitative and qualitative indicators. Quantitative indicators, as the name suggests, are used to measure the phenomena that can be easily counted. They can take different forms, numbers, averages, ratios, percentages, rates, or indices. Some of them, like numbers, are absolute measures and give a scale of the results, while the others, like percentages, are relative measures and give a reach of the result. For example, we can relatively easily count the number of startups that have been financed or the number of jobs that have been created by startups. On the other hand, qualitative indicators are used when it is not possible to clearly and uniquely quantify a change in a phenomenon, and they convey information in textual or descriptive form, including both statements of facts as well as opinion. Qualitative indicators summarize what people do, believe, or feel. For example, the level of satisfaction of entrepreneurs with their career choice or the degree to which individuals are interested in becoming entrepreneurs. Qualitative indicators are more complex yet they may be more relevant for assessing long-term impact of policy programs. Finally, in order to analyze the collected data and conduct monitoring and evaluation, there are a wide variety of methods available that we broadly divide, similarly to the indicators, in quantitative and qualitative methods. Qualitative methods have several strong points. First, they can provide in-depth insights into the local social, cultural and institutional context, as well as program and participant details. Second, qualitative research can also inductively discover and provide intuition for often surprising and sometimes counterintuitive relationships and patterns, leading to interesting and original hypotheses. And thirdly, qualitative research can help the interpretation of observed patterns and trends and the identification of mechanisms through which the program might be having an impact. Nevertheless, qualitative assessment is limited in terms of assessing outcomes against relevant alternatives or counterfactual outcomes. On the contrary, quantitative research methods are able to answer the questions of how much and establish how confident we can be in working hypotheses. Most importantly, quantitative methods can produce data that can be aggregated and analyzed to provide evidence-based inferences about relationships. These two groups of research techniques are complementary to each other and thus using their combination is typically considered to be the best approach in gaining a comprehensive view of the value of the program. 
We can call this a mixed methods approach. There are different ways of combining qualitative and quantitative approaches. One, by sequencing information for better analysis. We can either have a qualitative exploratory investigation followed by a quantitative analysis with the goal of testing elements of a theory or generalizing qualitative findings to larger samples. Or we can have a quantitative analysis followed by a qualitative one with the goal of explaining the quantitative results by exploring them in more detail. Second, we can have both analyses performed in parallel and triangulate the findings for better action. Or third, we can simply integrate methodologies for better measurement and understanding of the indicators. One needs to ponder the use of data sources and evaluation techniques and conceive an optimal choice depending on the type of information needed, the resources available and how precise the data need to be.